Good evening, everyone. Um, my Lord's Principal, Professor Ed Burns, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Great Hall of King's College London. Tonight, Lord Judge, one of the Dixon Poon School of Law's distinguished visitors, peels away some of the mystery and legend that surrounds Magna Carta. We're delighted to be able to host this lecture as one of the many varied and events surrounding the 800th anniversary of the Charter's grant. The title of his lecture, Magna Carta Uncovered, is also the title of a book by Lord Judge and Anthony Arledge, QC. I have read the book, I've had the privilege of coming to know the man, and I'm very much looking forward to the man speaking on the book. And there's two special reasons I say this. The first um, is the difficulty of icons. Any book about an icon, and make no mistake, Magna Carta is iconic, runs great risks. The risk is that, the risk for the author, is that the icon will use the author, not the other way around. Icons, by definition, do not reflect what really happened. Icons involve people and events that perhaps have grown in stature to fill some human need for legend, or perhaps have been more intentionally appropriated to support someone else's version of the event's significance. Thus, for an author to address an icon is to stretch perhaps too far something already exaggerated, or to unwittingly serve the agenda of those who regularly polish the icon. Yet ironically, it is also true that the original event became iconic for a reason. And often that reason is that the event was indeed very extraordinary. Icon icons thus are not only exaggerated or twisted, they often simultaneously are a grossly simplified version of what really occurred. And that simplification can strip away what made the underlying event so extraordinary. So a book about an icon presents tremendous challenges. It must, one, ex acknowledge the fact that the event has been transformed into an icon, its second must seek to recapture the significance of the choices implicit in the original event by restore, returning to its historic detail. Third, it should seek to identify and critique the power of the icon for co the contemporary world. And finally, it must seek to blend an appreciation of the complexity and contingency of the original event into the continuing influence of the icon. What, a, what is marvelous about this book, Magna Carta Uncovered, and I recommend it to you, is the authors do all this. They succeed in every respect. They first uncover and recapture Magna Carta as an extraordinary event in 1215. And they then rebuild its meaning for today, a meaning that is more rich and complex than a polished icon can offer. In short, Lord Judge, you have strolled in where scholars fear to tread and showed them how it is done. <coughs> Lord Judge, with the forensic skills of a lawyer, the insight of a historian, and the storytelling abilities of a grandfather, is ideally suited to tell us of the event and the icon that is Magna Carta. For those of you who find that the storytelling does not go on long enough, copies of that wonderful book will be available at the back of the hall after the lecture. The second reason tonight is special involves a note and a striking example, in my view, of the value of relationships and of civility. As I mentioned, Lord Judge wrote Magna Carta uncovered with Anthony Ulrich. I have received a note from his co-author, and he asked that it be conveyed to you. His note reads as follows. Igor Judge and I were pupils in the same set of chambers. Neither of us was given a place. 
Our professional paths crossed in a number of cases. Eventually, when he was a judge, I argued the meaning of Clause 40 of Magna Carta before him and Lord Chief Justice Lane. Existing authorities established that a trial could be stayed if there had been unreasonable delay and the defendant had suffered prejudice. I was representing a police officer who knew shortly after he made an arrest that a complaint was being made against him and he had contemporaneous notes. So it was difficult to say he had suffered prejudice. I turned to Clause 40, which simply provided that justice would not be delayed, with no mention of prejudice. I lost. <laughs> I knew of our mutual interest in legal history and with the 800th anniversary of the granting of Magna Carta suggested that we write a book on the subject. What followed was very much a joint effort. We criticized the other's contribution. I had difficulty with the fact that Igor would set out a proposition and gave no authority for it. One day I asked him, what's the authority for that? He replied, it's me. <laughs> I had to remind him that he was no longer Lord Chief Justice. <laughs> I am afraid tonight I cannot join you because I am rehearsing for a charity show in number one court at Old Bailey. I am very happy that Igor is first reserve. <laughs> Yours, Anthony Arledge. The note ends. <coughs> two lives intertwined. Two men who rise to be treasurer of Middle Temple. Two collaborators putting pen to paper. What I find striking is this in this note is this enduring relationship between these two men. Our stage is set. He is a man who is held in great affection from his littlest grandchild to the master of the roles. When he gave his last formal judgment as Lord Chief Justice, the courtroom of almost 300 people stood to applaud. We therefore count ourselves very fortunate that Lord Judge has found a home here at the Dixon School Dixon Poon School of Law as a distinguished visitor and visiting professor. His appointment has enriched our community as he is generous with both his legal expertise and his wisdom, giving workshops and master classes on challenging legal and ethical questions, addressing difficult questions about whether a woman has the right to refuse a cesarean section and what the constitutional consequences are of our present approach to assisted dying. In this 800th anniversary year, we are particularly fortunate to benefit from his special interest in all things Magna Carta. For Lord Judge's enduring love of history, we can thank his tutor, Ralph Bennett, Cambridge historian and Bletchley Park codebreaker, who advised Lord Judge that if he wanted to go to the bar, he should read history so that he would have a hobby for life. We are grateful that Lord Judge paid heed to the advice of his tutor and cultivated his, cultivated his interest in history alongside his unrivaled professional achievements. That, we, that he might begin to uncover for us some of the mystery of Magna Carta, please join me in welcoming Lord Judge to the lecture. Please come and find a seat at the front. Uh, principal, ladies and gentlemen, the truth was we were pupillage failures. And what the little note from Anthony Arledge did not get across was that uh, we were both told in that courteous way that the bar still has, we're really very sorry, there's just no room. As we looked round the chambers, we could see masses of places where they could have put a desk. But anyway, we comforted ourselves, and over a consoling half pint, we said, blank, blank, blank it. If we're still in this profession 50 years from now, let's write a book together. And that's the result. Now, it's 600 years before the foundation of King's College London, just a few minutes' walk from where we're all sitting, 
great events were taking place in what was then known as the New Temple. Late 1214, early 1215, King John based himself at the temple. Holy ground. You couldn't kill him if he was there. And there the first negotiations, which culminated in Magna Carta, took place. There, just two minutes walk from here. You can imagine them as they wheeled and dealed, and that's what they did. They wheeled and deed, dealed, or tried to, just coming up the hill here, just a bit of a hill, just to look over the river and think, hmm, I wonder if we put this, we might get that. And my really important point is these were people. They weren't just names on a piece of paper of a book that you might read. And they were like all of us here in this room, all of us with our own frailties, all groups, some leaders, some quiet, some thoughtful, some explosive, some in a hurry, some frightened of the consequences, just like any other group of people trying to negotiate a settlement. And it's just a strange coincidence that nowadays, and for the last few hundred years, barristers and judges walk through the temple, thousands of people walk through the temple every day to go to work, treading on the very ground where 800 years ago, men, sometimes armed, walked and talked and tried to broker an agreement. An agreement, mark you, between an anointed king, an anointed medieval king, and his dissatisfied subjects, which culminated in Magna Carta 1215. For me, Magna Carta is a living piece of history. It's not covered in dust. For me, it lives, and I hope that for you, it will live. Let's start at the beginning, though, with reflections from that charming spoof history, 1066 and all that, which I'm sure some of you have read. What it tells us about Magna Carta is that King John was compelled to sign the charter which provided, among other conditions, that no one shall be put to death, save for some reason, except the common people. Everyone shall be free, except the common people. The barons should not be tried, except by a special jury of barons. That would be because only barons would understand each other. So they spoof away at it, and they're right, up to a certain level. They have a point. Translate. Um, I'm not so sure so many of you will do the Latin now as did when I was a boy. But translate the text of the original Latin into modern English. Parliament? That's not in the Great Charter. Democracy? That's not in the Great Charter. Trial by jury? That's not in the Great Charter. Even more surprising, Magna Carta itself doesn't appear in the Great Charter. So all those words are missing. And so people tend to dismiss well, what does it matter? But there are words that are in the Charter that resonate to this day. Liberties, right, justice, lawful judgment, the law of the land, which became due process, the common council of the realm, which became parliament, and security, the crucial guarantee clause which was the law, rule of law in embryo. So the Charter didn't give us, in England, a written constitution. And although some of our constitutional arrangements are to be found in writings, like Magna Carta, Petition of Rights, the Bill of Rights, we'd never had a wholly written constitution. Perhaps we haven't ever had the need for one. Discuss. All right, don't discuss. That would be very, very rude while I'm talking to you. But <laughs> sometimes I wonder, and I'm making a serious point, whether the fact that our constitution is not a written constitution leads observers from countries which do have a written constitution 
rather to assume that because we don't have a written constitution, we don't have any constitution at all. They're wrong. Our long-standing constitution begins with Magna Carta. So we celebrate it. But if you look closely, you'll find that as we celebrate the document, it was never signed by King John, although all the pictures show him signing it. But it wasn't. It was sealed on his behalf, perhaps on the 19th of June, not the 15th. Although historians have spilled a lot of ink about it, and Professor David Carpenter of this university, the leading contemporary scholar, or certainly one of the leading contemporary scholars of the history of these turbulent years, makes the rather good forensic point. Only a barrister would make a point like this. Look, it says 15th June on it, so why is it the 19th of June? He's got a point, hasn't he? And no less important, the 15th of June or the 19th of June 1215 was not the only charter which falls within the description of what we call Magna Carta. There were, in fact, four such charters. John's, 1215, two, one in 1216, and one in 1217, both signed by the re sealed by the regent William Marshall and the papal legate, and the 1225 charter when the infant King Henry III had reached a sufficient age when he could assume legal powers and mark this traded a grant of tax for his seal on a new charter. We'll describe them all for convenience as Magna Carta, and we always have done. But it's not one, it's four. And the other thing we have to do about the Charter is not to get too grand about it. Certainly, in medieval Europe, there were equivalent charters being dished out by other monarchs. The Golden Bull of Hungary, 1222, 1231. Written concessions by the Holy Roman Emperor, 1220, 1231. Grants by the King of Aragon, 1283, 1287 were typical. Yet none of these survived. By contrast, Magna Carta was confirmed something like 50 times by English king until well into the 15th century. And it was constantly evolving. As it survived, as it was reissued, so it evolved. So, by 1237, it was being referred to as Magna Carta. Those words now appear. And perhaps more important, the title, I hope you don't mind the Latin, Magna Carta de Libertatibus Angliae, used for the first time in 1297, less than 100 years after 1215, 700 years ago now, formally linked Magna Carta with what we nowadays would describe as fundamental freedoms. So while other declarations of royal intent in charters disappeared into oblivion on the continent, Magna Carta, or the ideas which it represented, did not. Moreover, as the centuries unfolded, it came to be exported to places which none of those assembled at Runnymede had ever heard of, like the future United States of America or Australia. And its ideas of the development of constitutional and legal freedoms came to be encapsulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights described by Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the architects of the Declaration, as a Magna Carta for the modern world. The crucial fact to be absorbed is that Magna Carta was sealed in the middle of a civil war. Just one incident in a civil war. Its apparent inevitable destiny was the scrap heap. Not worth the vellum it was written on. Conceivably, I'm looking around to see the individual to whom I'm about to refer, conceivably an opportunity for a PhD study for a particularly bright but rather geekish student at King's College London. Can't see one of those. I mean the geekish. I can certainly see some very bright ones. Raise a hand if you know about the Charter of Liberties 
Listen to those emotive words, Charter of Liberties of Henry I. Please, I know somebody who knows it. <laughs> My wife's raised a hand. She's heard this lecture about a hundred times. <laughs> OK, that's its title. And what's it about? Uh, aspirations of firm peace, restoration of good old law. How many, raise a hand please, the Oxford Charter of King Stephen, excluding Professor Brand and Judith Judge. There's a general clause, promises justice and peace, the king will get rid of all unjust practices, he'll once again revert to the good old customs and ancient ones, not worth the vellum they were written on. By the time Magna Carta had arrived in the case of King Stephen, not worth the vellum. And you have to remember that medieval monarchs all over the continent always came to take office with an oath promising they will uphold the law, they'll be just, fair, good, peaceful. All the aspirations of any political party manifesto that you care to think of that you read in the lead up to the general election this year. All promises. The coronation oath was made by the new monarch to the Almighty in heaven. And it was to God, not to his subjects, that he was answerable. So, when he dies, he goes before the judgment seat and the Almighty passes judgment on him. Have you kept your coronation oath? Yes, welcome. There weren't many who had. Have you kept your coronation oath? You may say you did, but I've decided that you haven't. Down you go to hell. But the sentence, however appalling for the dead monarch's immortal soul, was not the slightest good and had no alleviation of the suffering of the subjects he'd left behind him on earth. So that's the context of the years of crisis and civil war. Rebel barons, anointed king. The rights and wrongs, I think, do not matter for today's purposes, though I am prepared to say, very boldly, that there wasn't a single baron there who was fighting for the democratic right of each subject to vote in a general election. But civil war is poisonous, poisonous. And there are people, there were people then still alive who could remember the civil war between Stephen and Matilda and the murder of Thomas of Becket was as recent to them as Winston Churchill is to many of us. The man I'm going to speak about a great deal, Marshall, his son was on the other side. Benjamin Franklin in the United States took one view, his son took another. They never spoke to each other. And the son of the son, i.e. Benjamin Franklin's grandson, agreed with his grandfather, not his father. Worse things happen in civil wars but it gives you some idea of what we have to reflect about. And then we have to remember that we were living in a time when life was short and cheap. The immortal soul and the heavenly judgment that would follow death was vividly in mind. So what I'm trying to get across is Magna Carta didn't emerge like a bright apparition with reverberating violins playing ascending chords and light emerging to brighten up the muddy field of Runnymede. It wasn't like that. It was set within its own context. And the context is political. England was under papal interdict by Pope Innocent III, just 10 years before the charter was sealed. No communion, no confession. Things that mattered greatly to people in medieval England. By January 1209, John himself excommunicated. Neither the interdict on his country nor his personal excommunication did any good. So then the Pope tried a new tack. He sentenced him to be deposed. And, using a phrase with which I'm afraid we have become all too familiar, and sadly so, authorized the King of France to wage holy war on John. Now this did bring John to attention. 
He was much more bothered by the impact of the papal order than the potential consequences to his mortal soul, and he immediately submitted to the Pope. And the consequence of this submission was that John accepted the Pope not only as his spiritual lord, but as his feudal lord. He surrendered his kingdom. He became the Pope's vassal. Now, what about this Pope? Never someone who knowingly undersold himself. Generously, he accepted that he was lower in status than God. I, I do. <laughs> yes, well, that's coming somewhere, isn't it? But, I'm quoting, he was greater than man, judge of all men, and judged by none. Can you imagine what the Eurosceptics of the day would have made of that? And then he directed, he directed the rebel barons that they were to pay taxes irrespective of whether they had consented or not. Uh, so he took the view very much against democracy. Nowadays, they'd have donned sackcloth and ashes and gone onto the program and spoken tonight on Newsnight for you. But they didn't do that in medieval times. They put on their weapons and armor. And into this turbulent mixture, there came the catastrophic defeat of King John's allies in France in 1214 at the Battle of Bouvines. So he came back to England utterly humiliated and wars then, as now, involved great expenditure. He hadn't got any money. He had to replenish his funds, no quantitative easing to uh, help him on his way. So he wanted to raise taxes, including something called scootage, to which I shall come. Now, scootage, shield money, an old form of taxation, works like this. You're my vassal, you have so much land, uh, you will have to bring four men to fight when I want to go to battle, or six, or ten, or one. So you looked around your estates and said, ah, oh, there's Tom, Dick, and Harry. They can bring a billhook, an axe, if they were rich, a stick, if they were poor, and off we'll go to fight. Well, this did not make for a great fighting force, did it? So the deal was... Look, instead of sending you Tom, Dick, and Harry, I'll send you some money, and with the money, you can buy proper soldiers, mercenaries, who fight. And so you've got a better chance of winning the battle. And so the king was entitled to claim scootage from you whenever he decided to do so. At least if he was entitled to, then he was going to tax you. So scootage, to pay for wars in France, in France, not in England, was resisted. And so off we went. Attempts were made to achieve a negotiated peace, as I said, at the very beginning, meetings here in the temple to try and work it all out. Uh, charter to the Church of England, fine. He hadn't suddenly become holy. The church was very powerful. Good. We'll get the church on our side. Then the next most powerful organization, the City of London, then as it is now. So he does a deal with it. May 1215, he grants the city power to have its own Lord Mayor. Fifteen years earlier, when the city had asked for it, he wanted a lot of money. This time, he handed it to them for nothing. In another modern world, he was appeasing the city and the church. And like appeasement in our world, it did the king no good. You appease when you're weak. And when you're weak, people do not respond the way you want them to. The city gates open to the rebel barons. Those of you who are here in London next November can come and have a grandstand vision of the Lord Mayor's show. It's a direct descendant from events in May 1215. The Lord Mayor is sworn in before the Lord Chief Justice. And so the parties met at Runnymede, armed. The barons had their terms and conditions ready they're called the Articles of the Barons. We still have them. They've got John's seal on them. The church, I'm sorry to say this, maybe it's not sorry, but the church certainly looked after itself, because although the barons hadn't asked for this, the first clause in the charter was to repeat the agreements for the church that had been achieved in the temple. John was in a hopeless position. 
His opponents had the largest forces. His own supporters among the nobility were only being true to him because of their oaths. They had no personal loyalty to him. The throne of England had been offered by the rebel barons to Louis of France. He had no cards to play, so he stuck his seal on the charter. And then we have it. Let me identify three crucial issues. One you're very familiar with, the justice provisions, justice not to be delayed or denied or sold. Consequence, still with us, you're entitled to have justice. You couldn't be locked up on the whim of a king or a baron. You're entitled to due process, and before long, well, that's not true, over the next hundred years, few hundred years, the writ of habeas corpus, the one that entitles you to go straight to a judge to have your freedom restored to you. What is more, this charter provided, rather newfangled idea, the punishment should fit the crime. And um, by the way, if there have been miscarriages of justice, we'll put them right. Only John said, we'll postpone that till I've come back from the crusade I intend to go on. And significantly, though it's overlooked, the enforcement bit of the system, the sheriffs, the coroners, the bailiffs, they weren't to be judges. So there's the justice provisions in brief. No scootage or aid, aid is tax, without the consent of the council of the realm, with provisions about how this council was to be summoned. The king wanted anything more by way of tax, he had to have it by consent. That, using metaphorical language, was also directed at Pope Innocent, who told them after all, they had to pay up. And during the regency for the boy king, to whom I shall come in a moment, this principle was applied. So the people who mattered, as people do, got used to the idea, has to be consent. The third paragraph that's crucial, third issue that's crucial, is the king's this agreement to this effect. It's very long, it's the longest clause in the whole charter. Summarizing, this is the deal. If I'm in breach of it, you can notify me. If I'm still in breach of it, and you notify me, you are then absolved from your oaths of obligations of loyalty, fealty, and obedience. You can take down my castles. So the right of resistance to the king is expressly authorized in this important clause. And the authorization extends to what is described as the whole community of the land. On the continent, they laughed at John for agreeing to what were described as overkings, 25 barons able to tell him what to do if he was in breach of the charter. And I mentioned to you, Professor Carpenter, his amazing researches have revealed a contemporary poem copied into the Melrose Chronicle. For those of you who don't know, Melrose is in Scotland. So we're talking about this story getting to Scotland of sufficient importance for the monk writing away in the script of the Chronicle to write this down. It reads, I'm quoting the translation of Professor Carpenter. England has ratified a perverse order. Who has heard of such an astonishing event? For the body aspired to be on top of the head. The people sought to rule the king. There are other provisions, but these are critical provisions in this medieval document. And so lots of copies were written out. Can you imagine it again? Please remember we're talking people one of the barons would have said to the other, oh, that was a bit close. And thank God Langton was here. He got the deal through. And I wonder, how, you know, I wonder what's going to go wrong with this. Look, they've just come out of a peace talk about Ukraine. Don't you think they're all talking to each other about whether it will stick? Of course they are. You've got to remember we're talking people. And then they all took an oath. We'll abide by this charter in good faith, without evil intent. And as those oaths were being taken, it's the medieval world, remember, there were a number of immortal souls going straight into a state of, mort of mortal sin, because John had not the slightest intention of abiding by the charter, which he believed, and with some force, had been pressurized out of him. In law, I give you a judgment now, 
the Charter's unenforceable as a contract, sealed under compulsion or duress. But, to coin another modern phrase, peace in our time was secured, for just a time even shorter than our Munich Agreement. The moment the Pope heard of it, and John had sent a messenger off to the Pope to tell him, the Pope immediately annulled it and didn't use language which could leave open any room for error. The bull began by describing John's wickedness, that's a good idea, rub his nose in it first, and how the crown of England and Ireland had been surrendered to the Pope, and then listen to the annulment of this charter, the document that we revere. We utterly reprobate and condemn any agreement of this kind, forbidding, under pain of our anathema, the foresaid king to observe it. It was declared void. The charter itself, all the obligations and safeguards in it, entirely abolished. They shall have no validity at any time whatsoever. So why are we celebrating? It's gone. The great charter of our liberties, gone. Not worth the vellum it was written on. If you'd been a betting man or woman, you would not have bet a penny on its future. And worse was to come. The Civil War then broke out for serious. A French invasion took place. I suppose everybody here thinks, as I used to till I started reading this stuff up, that the last invasion of England was in 1066 and it was called the Norman Conquest. But it isn't so. At the invitation of the rebel barons, however laudable they may seem in the drawings, they were traitors. They offered the throne of England to the Prince of France, later King of France, come and be our king. And the king, uh, the Prince of France, arrived here May 1216, Lord Mayor of London, another bunch of loyal folk, once again opened the gates to him. Military terms, 7,000 French troops, proper soldiers, not blokes from the farm with a billhook, are there. We were in danger of a Capetan king replacing the Plantagenets. And then two very fortunate things happened. Two men died. The first was innocent, and then in October 1216, John. To describe John's death as very fortunate is a privilege which, which we have to be careful about because we're looking back on it. At the time, it was a catastrophe. His heir, was a child, Henry III, a boy of nine years old. He didn't have a single uncle to act as his regent. He had no family to support him. This is a desperate moment. In medieval times, child kings had no future. Even with uncles, they didn't have a very good future. John himself had disposed of his nephew, Arthur, who had a better claim to the throne by way of primogenitor than John himself, and you all know what happened to the princes in the tower some 250 years later. So it was dire. Why was it fortunate as we look back? Rather than surrender to what seemed inevitable, the loyal barons, led by William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, arranged for this child to be crowned. But they couldn't do it in Westminster Abbey because the French were here. So they got the little boy to Gloucester, Gloucester Abbey, and he was crowned as Henry III. Within 10 days of taking over, uh, from, uh, sorry, of John's death, William Marshall, now approaching 70, was elected regent. He'd come up the ladder to advancement from virtually nowhere. At Runnymede, he'd been the main negotiator, main non-clerical negotiator for John. He had one amazing quality. Look into your own consciences. He was trusted on all sides because he always stood by his word. His word of fealty to some very vile-tempered Plantagenet kings, but he never left any of them betrayed. And he, with the papal legate, then issued the 1216 charter within days of becoming regent. What was it? Well, he was in a hopeless position. He had this little boy who was the titular king. He had no real authority, just the loyal barons had all sat around and said, it's you, William, and he said, 
No, really? I'm 70, you know, nearly. No, no, you're the one, you're the man. So he issued the charter, expressly referring to, in modern language at the end of, the, end of it, because it's in different terms, let's do a deal. Let's all meet up together and see if we can resolve this civil war. But the barons were in a strong position, the rebel ones. Louis didn't like it. No peace. 1217 comes. Now the situation is worse. Marshall suddenly hears, or the message gets through, that the French have split their forces. They've gone up to Lincoln to besiege a, a castle, the castle, which is loyal to the king. He goes straight up there with such forces as he has. A strategic opportunity occurs. Those of you who know Lincoln will know the steep hill and the way down, down the hill. And there it was. William Marshall was the great warrior of his time. And when the opportunity came, off he set into battle without a helmet. Can you imagine his poor squire, this great noble man? I'm sorry, sir. You, you've forgotten your helmet. You know, you have to be very brave to say. Anyway, the helmet was stuck on just as well after the battle. It was very heavily dented. But the point is that the battle ended in a significant defeat for the rebel barons. The French invasion floundered. Shortly afterwards in the sea battle, the French reinforcements were beaten off. And suddenly, peace was achieved because Marshall again issued the charter in different terms. But notice the difference. Not under compulsion, as John was at Runnymede, not out of a position of military weakness, as Marshall was in 1216, but now in a position of strength based on victory in battle, which mattered to the medieval mind. And he showed what one of our greater men, perhaps greater men, one of our greatest men, Winston Churchill, described as magnanimity in victory. He didn't want a civil war. He paid Louis to leave the country and abjure his claim to the throne. The rebel barons were all welcomed back into unity with the crown. It was a remarkable achievement. Peace had come. Shortly afterwards, in 1219, he died, one of the great heroes of our history, and we largely ignore him. But in the three short years of his regency, if he'd not stood by the boy king and accepted the responsibilities, and then won, and issued and reissued Magna Carta, and ruling by consensus, and bringing a civil war to an end, our history, that of the future United States of America, all the countries where the common law has taken root, would have been very different. And if you want to pay your respects to him, it's worth going anyway, because it's a magnificent building, go to the Temple Church, just down the road from here where you can see his effigy. Henry came to partial majority, then full majority. He needed money. He started having, oh goodness, our Plantagenet kings did have ambitions. He started thinking this boy, who now about 16, thought of time to take on the French again. Um, tax on movables, that's your personal property and your rents. Um, and he wanted, wanted one. Council met. 15th value of all movables wanted by the king. The council said, I'm paraphrasing it, before you have it, you issue the charter yourself. And in 1225, he did so. And there are some quite important features to notice. This charter actually says it's granted of the king's spontaneous goodwill to the whole class of the nobles and to all our realm. Quite interesting, the 1215 charter said that only the the deal done with the church was voluntary. Here, everything's voluntary. Henry III has been advised by Langton, Archbishop Langton. This isn't duress. You have to agree. It was a trading deal, a trade-off. You have your tax, give us our charter. And of course, by implication, abide by it. And this pattern developed through the reign. And although we tend to forget it again, there were times when the council refused financial support to the king, no less than three times in the 1240s. It had started to stick. And this feature of our medieval constitutional arrangements, very difficult for us not to transpose our own thoughts into medieval times, but 
don't let's look at it through our eyes. It's a start. And then the constitutional struggle in the 17th century and the establishment of the king in parliament as the ruling authority and the battle cry of the American rebels. I love saying that with David here. The battle cry of the American rebels, no taxation without representation. It's a straight line back to what was going on here in England between 1215 and 1225. And the withholding of tax demanded by the king until the grievances of the council, now by 1270, 1280, becoming parliament, represents one of the major reasons, if not the major reason, why we ended up with parliamentary government, while the Estates General in France, the Cortes in Spain, together with all the other promises in those charters issued in the 12th and 13th century, withered away under absolutist monarchs. Now, it's very easy for us all these years later to sneer at the charter. Barons were looking after themselves. Only three clauses of the charter now in force. What's all the fuss about? But with respect to them, they're wrong, because we know, because the historians have discovered this for us, that the charter made an immediate impact. I've already told you about what you find in the Melrose Chronicle. We know from the records that in 1220, 1220, a baron from Northumberland defended his right to maintain his castle and sought judgment in the court of the Lord King by the judgment of my peers. By 1226, there was a huge dispute in Lincolnshire, 1226, between the sheriff and four knights, not barons, not members of the nobility. The argument against the sheriff was that his actions were, quote, translated, of course, contrary to the liberty which they ought to have by the charter of the Lord King. No printing press, no iPad, no email, no newspaper, no news night. It had stuck. It had stuck. By 1234, the Great Council decided a case against the king, against the king, who admitted that he dispossessed somebody called Gilbert Bassett without a court giving lawful judgment of his peers and by the law of the land, a direct lift from Magna Carta. The council ordered that the land should be returned to Bassett. And at the time, in a treatise attributed to the judge Henry Bracton, we find this statement. The king is under God and under the law because the law makes the king. Now, it had stuck, and it stayed stuck. Parliament emerged. You know about Simon de Montfort. Of course it was not our Parliament. But everybody could turn up. They had enough votes. Of course, not everybody could vote. But there it is, increasingly influential. I just choose one example. Richard II is deposed by the future Henry IV. Of course the new king, having been victorious in battle, is going to get what he wants. But it's thought that to give the proper color to this change of regime, there's an article, there are articles of deposition. Read them, they're there in the records. We're lucky we have them. The articles justify Richard's removal because he refused to do justice according to law. He asserted that the laws were in his mouth and that he alone could alter and create the laws of the realm. And he had willfully contravened the statute of his realm, I'm quoting from the English translation, which provided that no free man shall be arrested or in any way destroyed, nor should the king proceed or order any process against him unless by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. I'm afraid he was guilty. Would have made no difference whether he'd been guilty or not, but he was guilty. The new king, according to his spokesman, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was determined to be advised and ruled, well, this was going a bit over the top, by honorable, wise, and prudent men with their common advice, counsel, and consent. But remember when Richard III came to the throne, act of parliament, to say, you're the king, 
And then two years later, when he dies in battle at Bosworth, Henry VII becomes king, and he goes to Parliament. Now, parliamentary sovereignty is still a long way off, but this combination of circumstances that I'm driving at leads to its increasing centrality in our constitutional arrangements and our liberties. These various circumstances include the invention of the printing press, profound differences of religious conscience and belief that emerged the authority gained by Parliament just because it was used by Henry VIII to achieve his mastery of the English Church, the anxieties about the succession to Queen Elizabeth, who will be the next king. Perhaps the reasons don't matter, but when James I succeeded to the throne, he had a very deep conviction, it was obviously genuinely held, that regal authority was bestowed by God on the monarch and that it was to God that the king was answerable. But where have we been with that before? On examination, it was precisely the problem which faced everybody in the early 13th century. If the king was answerable to God when he died and would be judged by God accordingly, his subjects here on earth would be left hoping that the next king would be succeeded, the next king would be a fairer, juster king. There's a wonderful moment when the Chief Justice, Cook, is being interviewed by James I, and Cook quotes Bracton to him. Do you remember? The king is subject to the law. James says, that is treason. You didn't have a nice end if you were regarded as guilty of treason in 16th and 17th century England. You were hanged, then you're, you were drawn, and then eventually quartered. Well, Cook was not hanged, drawn and quartered, but he was dismissed from office and sent to the Tower. But gradually, the exercise of what parliamentarians now regarded as their rights, privileges, were advanced under the banner of Magna Carta. Cook hadn't ever seen the 1215 version. He was relying on the 1225 version and then, like a good barrister, but not a good judge, he was adding things to it which weren't there. Nevertheless, it was leadership. He challenged the use of the word sovereign in relation to royal power. By now, he's a member of the House of Commons. He says about this, it is no parliamentary word. Magna Carta is such a fellow. He will have no sovereign. On another occasion, he said, if my sovereign would not allow me my inheritance, inheritance in the sense of birthrights, I must fly to Magna Carta. When the king says he cannot allow our liberties of right, this strikes at the root. We stand here for thousands and ten thousands. It was not democracy as we know it with universal franchise, but Magna Carta was the clarion call for the privileges of Parliament. When things go wrong in newer democracies, and we, don't we, we certainly perceive a slightly patronizing air among our commentators, perhaps even if we're honest with ourselves among ourselves, well, what do you expect? When we adopt that slightly patronizing air with people who are struggling to establish the democracy that we think that we have and want them to have, please let us remember Magna Carta's 800 years old and our present constitutional arrangements came slowly and that much blood was shed to achieve them. We all know that the battle between the King and Parliament and how it ended, the finest moment in Charles I's life, I'm not an admirer of him at all, but you can't withhold an extraordinary level of admiration for him for the dignity in the last few hours of and the moment of his execution. And then don't forget those who judged him fighting 10 years later, 11 years later, those who could be found condemned to death as traitors. A lot of blood had to be shed to get us where we are. By the end of the century, 
Charles's son James has abdicated. We had new rulers. They were chosen by Parliament. Our constitution became irrevocably based on, based on the sovereignty of Parliament. And if I may say so, the ideas for which Magna Carta was the inspiration had triumphed here. In the meantime, forgive me. In the meantime, we were colonizing the eastern seaboard of the United States, or the future United States. 350,000 people left England between 1616 and 1700. In population terms, that is a huge proportion of the then population. The colonists themselves treated Magna Carta as the foundation for their own ideas. Not an accident. First charter granted in the states, future states, I, I must just put future in every time I say states, to Virginia in 1616, called the Great Charter. They had the same rights as Englishmen, including the right to trial by jury. Freedom of speech, too. Assembly in Maryland legislated that all inhabitants should have the same rights and liberties according to the Great Charter of England. Massachusetts, they tried to frame a, ground, grounds of a body with grounds of law in resemblance to a Magna Carta. And it was to Magna Carta that after the sovereignty of Parliament was established here that the colonists turned when one of the most absurd pieces of legislation this Parliament, our Parliament, has ever produced was enacted, the Stamp Act of 1765. It wasn't little postage stamps. Every document, every piece of business you had to pay tax on. And then, when that was objected to rather vociferously, they abolished the Stamp Act but passed the Declaratory Act, even more provocative. OK, we'll not worry about the Stamp Act. It wasn't going to bring much money in any way. But you understand, whatever we say goes. It led to rebellion. And the colonists relied on Magna Carta. But then they had to face something else. Precious as it was, hang on, it's led to parliamentary sovereignty. Our problem is parliament. They've enacted these absurd statutes without us being represented. Something's wrong here. So relying on their Magna Carta rights, they rejected parliamentary sovereignty. But just to make sure parliamentary sovereignty didn't prevail, they turned to John Locke and natural law rights by now, we're in the full flow of 18th century ways of writing. Rights not created by parchments and seals, but rights founded on immutable maxims of reason and justice. I love the word immutable. Immutable means what I think. But, but they produced a constitutional arrangement which limited, they didn't call it parliament, but limited the authority of the two houses limited the authority of the president and gave authority to the Constitution itself. The Constitution was to be supreme. That is why Magna Carta is venerated in the United States. It is a strange paradox that inspired by the same source, two great democracies, one of which used to be the most powerful nation on earth and of one of which is probably still even now the most powerful nation on earth, ended with fundamentally different constitutions. Yet both have Magna Carta as their foundation. Or putting it another way, Magna Carta is bred into the bones of their constitutional arrangements. The short answer is that both were creatures of their time in exactly the same way as Magna Carta in June 1215 to summer of 1225 was itself by its terms, a product of its times, and the men, I'm afraid there were no women involved in this, and the men who produced it. And none of them emerged from vaporless gas. For me, they've not dissipated. For me, Magna Carta remains, and I'd like to think that for all of you, it does remain. The banner, the watchword, the emblem of the liberties which we continue to enjoy in this country. It does remain the case, you know, that when they're believed to be threatened, people say Magna Carta. They don't know what Magna Carta says. 
That's not a criticism, they just don't know. For example, we had a huge row in the last parliament when Labour was in power about reducing some of the rights to trial by jury. Individual after individual stood up in the House of Parliament, either Commons or Law, and said, it's against Magna Carta. We've had trial by jury since Magna Carta. We haven't. But it's symbolic. We turn to the words Magna Carta as a response to what we perceive to be a threat to our liberties. And there are the words, aren't there? Justice, liberties, right, law, consent, they remain the foundations for a free society. I've got one last reflection. It's a warning direct from the first publication of Magna Carta in the United States in 1687 by William Penn of Pennsylvania, and I don't choose it simply by way of a compliment to the dean, but I offer you this quotation from William Penn. William Penn was the man who'd been tried at the Old Bailey uh, for riotous assembly and the jury would not convict him in spite of the huge bullying efforts of the judge to get him convicted. William Penn. It is easier to part with or give away great privileges, but hard to be gained if once lost. What William Penn called privileges, we call rights. You may ask, what's in a word? And the short answer, there are still too many countries in the world waiting for what we call our rights, who would regard what we have as privilege for, privileges for them to be won and eventually entrenched. We must guard our privileges. We must guard them better if they remember that they are privileges, which others do not enjoy. There are a number of you here who are very young, I mean very young compared to me, forgive me, but some of you are very young. You're here at an amazing institution. You're bright, you're intelligent, you're among the best that we have in our country or the best from the countries that some of you come from. Forgive me saying so, you have a responsibility to guard these privileges. The privileges of people who don't like you and who you don't like. Bear in mind, that's what equality before the law means. If you sacrifice what William Penn described as the great privileges, if you treat your privileges with smug indifference, your own privileges will disappear. The rule of law does not live in a vacuum. It will not survive if it is taken for granted. And without vigilance, the inheritance of Magna Carta will be no more than physically it is a lot of words written on a piece of medieval vellum. And the generation that allows this to happen will pay a very harsh penalty for its indifference. If I may say so to the young, but to all of us, we must guard our heritage. Thank you very much. <laughs>